welcome to Chatting with Interesting People. Today I'm joined by the lovely Cheetah. Hello, Cheetah. Hello, Steve. Um, I've known you for a few years now. You've been kind of a member of our um, uh, the fibromyalgia group that uh, you help run as well. It's a pleasure to finally get you here and find out more about you. Yay! Thanks for having me. Uh, well, let, let, let's start with where you are at the moment. You're in you're in Birmingham, aren't you? I live in Birmingham. Yeah. And so, how, how long have you been there? I moved to Birmingham. I think it's at the end of 2016. So almost six and a half years, I think. Wow. Um, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We'll come back to finding out why you were in Birmingham in a bit. Um, so let, let's start with um, yeah, going back uh, to where you were born and uh, grew up. Yeah, so I was born in Indonesia. So that's about 7,000 miles away from here. Um, but yeah, I've, I've moved, I moved to the UK when I was 21. Um, so I've been here for quite a bit, but um, I spent my entire childhood in Jakarta, in Indonesia. J- Jakarta's the capital, isn't it? Jakarta is the capital, yeah. Um, so it's in the island of Java. Indonesia has got about 17,000 islands. Um, I think the, the people live in about 6,000 okay it's, it's one of those places that we've heard of i suppose in the uk and um uh, uh, some other people kind of watch from america mainly i suppose so uh to, to the western world we don't really know too much about indonesia apart from it's the other side of the world but it's between um australia and india i suppose isn't it yeah so it's between the indian and pacific oceans but um, so it was colonized uh, mainly by the Dutch. So it was known at the time as Dutch East Indies. Um, and the word Indonesia, it didn't become an official name until when it got its independence. But it was used, um, I think, since like late 1800. So it's thought to derive from Indos, means India. And Nessos means meaning island, so it's like island of Indian Ocean, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, and we've heard of you've you mentioned Java, which is somewhere that yeah we we tend to know for coffee. Um, and then I suppose the other big name we've heard of, which I don't think represents Indonesia really, does it? But we we tend to hear of Bali as a kind of a, yeah. a touristy kind of. No. no, Bali is a holiday island. It's full of foreigners. Um, it's like if you live in the UK, it's like people going to Benidorm and Spain and you know, for a for a fun holiday. Um, so I think that's why it's quite well known for Bali. And sometimes people think it's Bali in Indonesia because they thought it's separate. But Indonesia is quite big. So if you go from the most western point to the most eastern point, the distance between the two uh, is about the length from London to Iran. That's a very long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like London <laughs> from to Tehran. So it's it's massive. It's completely spread out and and, and Um, that's not even just across europe which we think of as massive but yeah so much yeah um it's big so it's a big population um 260 million but most people i think 60 percent live in the island of java so it's a tiny island um but most people live there because it's like the economy capital of the country um but it's quite good because um, so Indonesia has obviously the, one of the largest population in the world. Um, it's forested, like most forested on the earth after the Amazon forest in Brazil. Um, I think 13% of the world mammals are in, in the, uh, are like in Indonesia as well. Wow. Um, and so my dad was 
uh, geologists and um, Indonesia is a volcanically active country. So we've got the world most volcanoes of any other country in the world. And there's about, I think, over 70, uh, between 70 to 80 volcanoes that have erupted more than a thousand times in total, I think. So it's a quite wow. a good, yeah. So I think it's not, as well known i suppose to a lot of people in the uk that i've met but if you are working in the field of geology earth science they will know about indonesia yeah i, I recently interviewed someone from tonga and okay. so that's i mean relatively close um yeah. but it's that same kind of the volcanic section isn't it yeah and you uh krakatoa that's one of the volcanoes that we hear about in school that's it's been one of the biggest eruptions i think isn't it and that's in indonesia isn't it yeah so we know it's as krakatau um with you but yeah it was in indonesia as well so um it's a quite a good place to study about volcanoes yeah <laughs> You, you grew up there and your dad was a geologist through that time? Yeah, um, so I grew up in Indonesia. My dad um, is a geologist and my mum's uh, she's a retired uh, former professor in international relations. Um, it's quite interesting because so my granddad uh, from my mum's side, he was an English teacher, so he was still teaching until he was 75 and my grandma was a history teacher and so she used to talk about Henry VIII, the Battle of Waterloo, <laughs> yeah. you know things that happen in Europe because she was a world history teacher and um, they live quite humbly because they were teachers with seven children but my grandma always say oh you know I wish I've been to the UK but if I didn't have the opportunity to go there, maybe one my, one of my children will. And if my one of my children won't be able to, maybe it will be my grandchildren. So it was quite exciting when I first moved here and came back for holiday, bringing all the stuff and merchandise from London. <laughs> what What did you study through school and uh, yeah. go on to? So I went to law school after uh, finishing secondary school. Um, and so law school was quite interesting because I think when I entered, I was always, you're thinking about the courts and judges and the law. And then when I was in law school, most people talk about being a corporate lawyer, you know, working in an office. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, on my final year, I got bitten by a mosquito and I was hospitalized with dengue fever. Um, I think I was hospitalized for 15 days because it was a severe dengue fever. So you have to be hooked to IV. Um, and because at the time in Indonesia, you didn't have like a mass universal health, health coverage you can get a state health insurance if you work as a civil servants as teachers but not for most of the public thankfully i will i uh, my parents were quite privileged and we were able to be hospitalized privately in a private hospital um but it was i mean it was not great to be ill with severe dengue but you know i I think it was the first time where I really realized, oh, my God, you know, if you don't have much money, you can't be ill because you can easily die. Um, so I decided to switch major from economics law to studying health law. And that's why I then moved to the UK initially to go to UCL. Um, so I studied healthcare law and bioethics at UCL, and that's where my interests now, until now, I'm still working in health policy. So, yeah. 
Okay, and that gives you, I suppose, a, a quite a, a varied idea of um, kind of the health services comparing, yeah, particularly in Indonesia and the UK. But I suppose through that, you've also picked up a bit more of an international idea as well, haven't you? Yeah, so I think initially um, it was a good learning because I want to know um, healthcare system in and uh, other countries in the world. Um, so on the positive side, I think a few years after I got ill, uh, the country actually started their, so they, the government has dramatically increased public spending, they ensured more resources were available. Um, and then in 2014, I believe, they established a national health insurance scheme which was a crucial step towards uh, universal health coverage. So it's a bit like the NHS now. And in some ways, um, because it's quite new, um, there's a lot of things that are quite modern because, you know, it's only just been established. So now everyone has affordable access to healthcare when they need it. So it's quite vital to the right to health. Um, when I was at UCL, what I studied was, uh, I think my main research at the time was on infectious disease. Um, so how the low work um, on infectious diseases. But I realized that most of our problems now is with chronic health care, you know, diabetes, heart attacks. And that's why when I went to do my PhD, I learned about obesity because it's one of those issues where people now live longer, but they're unhealthy. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's it's been quite a shift from having dengue fever to <laughs> to where I am now. That must be so fascinating to kind of see how. Uh... The, the kind of the health service is changing through Indonesia and hopefully improving and becoming a better um, service while at the same time seeing how the NHS is struggling more and more. Yeah, no, it's been um, it's been quite interesting because obviously I've now lived in the UK for, I don't know, eight, nine years, so quite a while. Um, and I'm working in health policy now. Um, where one of my job description is to look at health commissioning and how the health system deals with disabilities and you know how we can make a better system for people who have uh, muscular dystrophy. So it's been quite an interesting way to keep updated about what's going on in the NHS, um, which is... Um, it's like religion, isn't it, the NHS? Because it's something that we really appreciate it here. And like people in the UK, whatever their political perspectives, they like the NHS and they're grateful for it. So it's um it's it's a stressful time, I think, for all the healthcare workers out there. But yeah, so looking forward to see what's gonna happen. There's all these amazing services, but we like to kind of complain. And so, yeah, we we know the NHS is amazing, um, but we also know that it's got its yeah you know, they've got the difficulties. So, uh, yeah, um, as a lot of people who will follow um, my channel will know that, um, you know, I've had you know get chronic health problems for a while, and yeah, the NHS has been a, a lifesaver literally for me. And um, I, I guess it, you know, you've got your own health um, problems that you've had um, throughout your time here as well. So you've seen it from that side as well. Yeah, no. Um, when I first moved to the UK, I think it's quite interesting because. Um, so the first time I went here was actually to study for a legal English course. And I remember getting picked up at Heathrow Airport by my host family and they live quite near to Waterloo. And I always thought, you know, 
wow, London is so glamorous. You're thinking of the King's Waterloo Sunset. That was a beautiful moment for me to just be at Waterloo Station. Um, but you always imagine, you know, Big Ben and glam buildings and everything. And so you wouldn't expect, I think, until I actually live and work here, that there, there are certain challenges which you wouldn't expect with poverty and homelessness. And, you know, you I know you volunteer at the food bank. So mm. when I was living in back home, I wouldn't have expected there's such thing as food bank because you imagine it as a very rich country. Um, but it's, I don't think people in the UK complain a lot. I think you've, you've, you've had such a long um, process of building this developed country. So you have more demands and you have more resources. Um, so people ask for it. Um, coming from Indonesia, I think, it sort of helps you be more accepting toward certain things. Um, because in Indonesia, the poverty is very visible. And so when you come to the UK, even for me, just going in the bus and you know how in the bus they've got like a press, a button for mm. to stop Yeah. Uh, at the point that you want to stop? So we didn't have that in my in the bus. Um, and then I went to the bus and then they have a section for a wheelchair. Um, and when I was at UCL as well, because I'm I'll sure I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but I have fibromyalgia, which is an invisible disability. And so I spoke to UCL and they registered me as disabled, and then they started giving me assistance. Uh, longer deadlines for and then exams they give me regular breaks during exam to make sure that that was not available for me back home especially you know I'm not in a wheelchair I'm not blind or deaf or hard of hearing um, so I was really grateful for being in the UK because I came from a point where everything wasn't available um, so now I don't think I complain as much, but certainly you want the <laughs> country to <laughs> continue to get better. Um, so I think I complain professionally, but coming from where I am growing up, I thought this country is still very amazing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I suppose our history is well known, or you know, bits of it across the world. Uh, but yeah, as you say, the the, the poverty is very i suppose it's always kind of been kind of pushed under the carpet and we've not really you know approached that subject but recently especially the last few years have shown quite how difficult some people have it here but i know that you know that the contrast with other places is uh you know shocking really because we we do have we still have some support, even if it doesn't quite help us enough. Yeah, no, it's um. So at the end of my masters, um, I managed to get an internship at Bernardo's, um, which was, I think it still is the children, the largest children's charity, and yeah, then so. through because I'm because I have fibromyalgia, I was eligible to apply for it's a program called change 100 um which was organized by the disability charity leonard cheshire um okay. so i got uh i i got accepted to do work shadowing to professor dame sally davis who was the former chief medical officer before chris whitty um, so I work shadowed her in Whitehall. I saw how the health system works. I saw how she dealt with pressing challenges um, on a daily basis, uh, which was just brilliant. But yeah, it's um, so it was a quite interesting time. And I think that's one of the reasons why I decided to to work in this field as well, because 
you know, every year you hear about the challenge of perilous winter for the NHS and care services. There are no quick fixes. Obviously, now you hear about ambulance services. So it's, yeah, it's a challenge. And yeah, but it's, I've, I'm quite grateful with the NHS because with the health um, conditions that I have, I think with private health insurance, my premium will just go up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what one of the things that's uh, that we don't necessarily realize is that there's a um a, a relationship between poverty and uh disability and chronic health and uh, uh people with health conditions are disproportionately affected um is that something that you've kind of looked at a bit with your uh with your courses yeah so i think when i was doing my phd um so social determinants of health is something that um, was featuring quite a lot because it's easy enough to tell people you need to eat healthy food but when you've got people lining up at the food bank because they can't afford even the basic essential food you can't expect people to change their diet to fruit and vegetables a day because it wouldn't be the first thing on their mind and the costs as well for healthy food often are more expensive than just buying processed food. Um, the way people live as well. So, for example, if you live, um, I think one of the most example that's quite well known is Glasgow, where if you live in the richest postcode in Glasgow, you can have life expectancy until 84 I think at the time, and if you live at the poorest postcode, it will be about 55. So there's a huge gap um, yeah, massive. with postcode lottery, you know, where you were born, because uh, socially, it, it how we live a healthy life really depends on whether the environments that we live in are healthy. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's... It's an important aspect of any health programs is to make sure that people can actually afford to live a healthy life and not just telling people, you know, oh, don't smoke, don't, don't eat uh, fast food. But if you live in an area where all you can see is fast food, you've got the advertising and marketing on television you know especially on social media now it's 24 hours um people yeah it will be hard for people to live a healthy life so it's it really corresponds about your socioeconomic factors i suppose which is um yeah uh, a big thing yeah and i think that um schools they, they might be changing a bit and improving but we never really got taught how to cook there. We did home economics, which featured kind of various different bits. But yeah, you know, once or twice we might learn how to make something. But generally, I think we learn it from our yeah you know, our, our homes. And so I learned a few bits from my parents. But yeah, most of most of it doesn't necessarily get taught anywhere else yeah well I didn't go I didn't study in the UK uh, mm. but it so my research you know initially before you mentioned about international aspects so I look at Latin America was one of the place where I look at obesity policies um, for example in certain states in Mexico now if you buy um, coke and soda you have the logo that you cannot buy it if you're under 18 with a with and it carries health warning which at the moment we only have for cigarettes mm. um and if you go to places like chile um when you buy cereals for example it wouldn't have the logo in the cartoons that are attractive to children it will just be the serial name you know a box with cereals um so that it's not appealing to children so there's a lot of ways where 
the UK, I think, is a bit left behind compared to Latin American countries. Um, I mean, compared to Indonesia, it's uh, a bit more forward because now we have uh, the sugar tax and in Indonesia, we not yet have that. Um, so, you know, it's um, it's a progress everywhere in the world, really, but it's one of those socioeconomic um, interventions that we're trying to do and I was learning about in my PhD. It seemed hard enough in this country for the cigarettes to get plain packaging and to get rid of all the kind of the the fancy marketing and things. So I can't imagine how we'd, yeah, how, how we'd react if someone says about getting rid of fancy cartoons on the sugar and cereals. <laughs> well, talking about smoking in Indonesia, actually smoking rates are amongst one of the highest in the world. I think 67.1% of adult male smoke. Wow, that's, um, yeah. it's got about two hundred twenty thousand of tobacco related deaths each year. Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit it's way more behind in tobacco because I think the UK rates is about fourteen percent. Um, so it's quite okay. yeah. That that is good, and um, it yeah, I'm guessing it's not a figure you probably know off the top of your head, but seeing how, how much difference it's made in the UK since yeah j j there was the smoking ban and then yeah the packaging got horrible kind of health pictures to kind of say, yeah. This yeah, is we have a and... smoking ban in public places while Indonesia, um, if you go to airports, you still have smoking rooms where you can go in and smoke if you want to indoors. Um, it's because Indonesia never signed a tobacco control treaty um and when you don't sign up to this uh you know you, it's hard to regulate if you don't sign up to fctc treaty um but yeah now uh i went back after i submitted my phd last year and i went to this restaurant and on the menu so they're giving you like a piece of paper where you can write what items do you want you tick the boxes and it's got cigarettes in it okay <laughs> so you can actually order it through the table which was you know if you live here it's insane just like wow what's happened um yeah. but now i mean in the uk with food buying i read about um, I don't know if it was Trussell Trust, but I read about Prince William and, uh, you know, the Prince and Princess of Wales a few weeks ago went to a food bank in Windsor. I wouldn't have expected if you live in Windsor that you will have a food bank there. So it's, um, um, there are some interesting things in the UK, with, which I did not expect when I came here. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, I'm in one of the richest areas of the country i suppose um and yeah in the kind of the, the heart of london southwest london you know we've got uh places like kensington westminster you know all of those on on our doorstep which people will have heard of and think of as very rich but we also have it's something like a third of children are in extreme poverty in this area and it's unbelievable to kind of hear that in what's meant to be such a, a wealthy country and a wealthy area of it. Yeah, no, it's um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? When uh, we had ch changes in government last year with the Queen's death and a few changes of the prime minister, I was in Indonesia, so people started asking me questions about, ooh, what's going to happen? Oh, you have a new prime minister again. And I was <laughs> like, don't know how to answer all of this. <laughs> yeah, but, we, we we did go through a couple of prime ministers last year. No, but no, it's, it's good to be here. And I, you know, I really enjoy, um, because it's such a diverse place, 
um, as well in, well, where I am in Birmingham. And then obviously I, my office is in London, so it's very multicultural. So it's great to see people from other countries and learning about cultures. And um, so it's been brilliant, yeah. And um, obviously we've had a global pandemic over the last few years. Um, how have you found that kind of in the UK compared to what you've you know, heard from back home in Indonesia? It's a bit strange in a way because when other countries have already started reporting uh, their COVID data, it took them a while because they kept insisting that the number was zero, which was obviously not true. And then now they become one of the centers for one of the highest rates of COVID at the time. Um, but what's interesting as well is um, it's not, I suppose it's because Indonesia was formerly a uh, controlled by an authoritarian regime for 32 years. Uh, but people there didn't really protest about vaccination or wearing a mask. I think they're quite, in that sense, they're quite more um, compliant with being told to get vaccinated and being told to wear a mask, unlike in the UK, where it became a really, really big thing. Um, just politically it's different um but now i mean i got all my four vaccinations here in the uk um and it's you know it's a stressful time for everybody um and i mean i work i'm able to work from home uh my partner can work from home so it's um at least for both of us we have things that keeps us going but I would I couldn't imagine if I have been a healthcare professional it must have been stressful time or if you work in a care home where you have one of the most vulnerable residents mm. but yeah but fibromyalgia and ME I think I mean it's categorized as a neurological disorder but I think at the time there was a confusion whether could we get priorities in early vaccination mm. are we vulnerable enough or are we actually the same um so it's quite interesting and I I think I had to sort of argue with my GP about it and thankfully there's you know charities like uh Lindsay's Fibromyalgia Awareness UK and FMA UK that were so quick about you know connecting people with fibromyalgia so we can share information and what's happening in other places yeah, and um, I I didn't qualify as a priority for the vaccines until the booster, oh. which seemed a bit strange. But um, somewhere along the lines, they decided that um, uh, I, I think um, the suggestion was that fibromyalgia might be autoimmune. But um, I, I know that it kind of because it's not completely understood then there's a lot of different ideas about what it is and which classification it comes under yeah I think so because when I was living in London I will get my regular flu jab for free and the first time I moved to Birmingham when I asked for my free flu jab they say well you have fibro it doesn't actually qualify for a free flu jab it's not until a bit later that they say okay, we'll give you a flu jab, especially during the pandemic. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's um, it's quite interesting how the disease features. I mean, I don't know much about, uh, you know, obviously the science of neurological diseases because I wasn't trained as a doctor, but um, it, it can really impact you know, everyone's day-to-day -day life if they have fibromyalgia and you wouldn't want to get the flu or COVID mm. because it could be impacted. So yeah, it was it was an interesting times really. Yeah, well, one of the useful things I suppose is that people who did get um, 
you know, flu or COVID or even long COVID have become a lot more aware of how that impacts them and then seeing how uh, that relates to fibromyalgia has been quite helpful, I think, for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, but it's uh, when I went back last year, uh, I went back to Indonesia for a few months. Everyone was still masking up. I've, this was at the end of last year. So in the UK, we've already uh, stopped all the COVID regulations. Uh, but when I was there, if you're indoor, even outdoor, people were still masking. Um, so it's um, it's it's quite strange because you come from the UK and then you go to this country and everyone's still wearing a mask. Um, no, but yeah, it's a. Uh, it's an interesting time, but uh, I I do enjoy. I think with what I do now, um, you know, read uh, working in muscular dystrophy as well. Um, there's a lot of things about the NHS where I'm still a bit surprised about. Like for example, if you live in the Isle of Wight, because they don't have specific neuromuscular services, you will have to travel. To Southampton to get certain treatments or if you live in Scotland you know in one of the islands the doctors will have to you know they have to travel quite a lot uh, and if you live in North Wales often you have to go to Alderhey and stuff to get treatment um, so I think in the UK there's still a lot where it's a bit unequal in in terms of access uh depending on where you live um just yeah. like so people i suppose need to go to a, a major town or city um and yeah since you've been here then you've been very fortunate to live in yeah a couple of the massive cities that have got so many resources on the doorstep but yeah, as soon as you go further out, then uh, yeah, there, there there are distances. But I suppose compared to a lot of other countries, again, we're quite fortunate because those might be a few hours journey. But uh, that's... yeah, I I was reading about America about you know if you live in Texas, you could drive for eleven hours or something, and you would still be in Texas. I think. Because it's so huge. And, you know, if someone had told me, especially now that I live in Birmingham, if someone had told me, oh, do you want to come to my house? It's about 30 minutes drive. I'd be like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, when I went to London after the pandemic, because I hadn't been for, you know, a couple of years, and I was visiting our friend Charlie, who live in Ealing. And to get from Euston Station to Ealing, I thought, God, London is so big. <laughs> Takes ages to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, America is something else, isn't it? Because it's massive. But Indonesia, it can be even worse because it's islands. Um, I think if you if I want to fly to the end of the most eastern point of Indonesia, it can be about six hours or something because of how massive it is. So it's um it's been quite interesting learning about the UK in full uh for being here for years with you know comparing what was what it was like in Indonesia, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you you were saying earlier that you um you studied infectious diseases, and uh, you, you've th since been asked to do various talks on on that, haven't you? Um, yeah, well, I talk a few uh, a lot at the time about um, what was it? Not vaccine passport. Uh, I think it was something to do with vaccine equity uh which feature quite a lot because uh there was an unequal access at the time uh, with patent and you know pharmaceutical after the vaccine was being made um so uh that was one of the things that i talk about 
um, I gave quite a lot of talk about obesity mainly, so sugar taxes, um, healthy school meals. I've given a talk about that because I think if you live in France, they ban vending machines in school. I'm not sure about the UK now, uh, but there. Uh, I think if you live in London, is it the new regulation that you're not allowed to have a takeaway places? Four hundred uh, meters from schools. I, I'm not sure of the exact distance, but yes, we have takeaway places everywhere, and yeah. especially in the poorer areas. And they, there were tons that were just kind of, yeah, circling the schools. So there has definitely been a an, an attempt to kind of push them back. Yeah, nutritional school meals. But I've also given a talk about disability for uh, several times uh, because I wrote an article on my first year at UCL um, in Indonesian about studying in the UK with a disability. And I actually got quite a lot of response from people who are hard of hearing and have certain illnesses and conditions where they never realized that you could study if you have disability which was heartbreaking but it's um it's quite interesting to to tell them about how we dealt with that in this country I mean it's not perfect but there's help out there if you go to universities you can register of having a disability and then they can modify your deadlines and exams and how it, the exam is structured so things that still not available back home um so it's been you know it's been quite interesting as well and like in the uk we have guide dogs if you're legally blind um in indonesia we we don't have them um so it's it's very very difficult if you're on a wheelchair or visually impaired to actually get around um so yeah i i give quite a lot of talks about disability um in the UK um which was um you know it's it's quite good uh I mean it's got its own challenges but um there's a lot of examples where I think if you didn't grow up here um you're quite excited about reading um I was really excited about a bus having a wheelchair space which is a <laughs> basic minimum but coming from a developing country I I didn't know that it exists so you know, I, I give quite a lot of talk about that as well. Yeah, I, I suppose that's one of the uh, fascinating things is that you've been studying kind of um, health in different countries uh, and then you've kind of got a few different experiences of it. Um, and then on top of that, you're then able to see even more examples from yeah your work and things like that and there's just so many different levels of uh knowledge and experience yeah um i do hope that the nhs will never be privatized uh because it's it's one of the most brilliant you know fundamental things we have in this country that unites everyone you work you're working for a charity um focusing on muscular dystrophy um it's not a subject that I've kind of heard much about. Uh, can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so um, muscular dystrophy. So it's a group of conditions uh, which cause progressive weaknesses and loss of muscle mass. So I think with muscular dystrophy, uh, you've got abnormal genes that you inherited and it mutates uh, and it interferes with the production of proteins or that you need from a healthy muscle. Um, there are many kinds of muscular dystrophy. I think there's about 60 of them. Um, but it's um, it can really, because it causes your muscles to weaken, then it can affect uh, the heart or the muscles used for breathing, which uh, can become life-threatening as well. Um, there's no cure, I think, but the, there's regular treatments, there's certain medications if you have certain conditions of muscular dystrophy to manage the symptoms. Um, but it's, I th 
when you have muscular dystrophy, especially certain muscular dystrophy, you might then use a breathing machine to help you breathe. Uh, you might need some cuff assist machines. It, it, this really depends on the type of muscular dystrophy uh, you have because not all types actually cause severe disability and many don't affect your life expectancy. Um, but uh, because I'm working in policy, it's been quite good, uh, you know, trying to monitor what's going on in the parliament, trying to campaign for um, certain things and meeting with not just patients, but also clinicians and hear from them about lack of services sometimes and lack of access to patients. So, you know, interesting things that, that are happening, but it's quite rare. So I think it affects in the UK, we have about 110,000 people with some form of muscular dystrophy. Um, so it's it's still one of those rare diseases. Um, so there's a lot of challenges that comes with it. If you're enjoying this content, then please do subscribe, follow, like, however your podcast provider puts it. And down in the description, you will find a link to my Patreon. I would be so grateful if some of you check that one out as well. And now back to the chat. What I've found, I think a few weeks back I was attending a meeting uh well a board meeting in public of one of the northwest London um integrated care boards and um they have a business case about improving musculoskeletal service in northwest London um which was I mean I attended the event for work but it's quite interesting to see the business cases because then if it affects people living in northwest London with fibromyalgia, rheumatology issues. Um, so, you know, um, I I don't know what when they will start implementing the business case, uh, but we'll see. Um, at the moment, if you have muscular dystrophy uh, and you live in northwest London, they don't actually have a neuromuscular care advisor so it's someone who sort of navigate and coordinate your care um, in the region which is quite a shame and hopefully uh, they'll do something about that and it's mm. been a great place to for my career it's been a great you know a lot of lessons that I've learned and it's great to be involved directly in campaigning and stuff on a day-to-day -day basis um, but yeah, with muscular dystrophy, the diagnosing, you know, you've got electrical tests, you can have muscle biopsy where the small tissue sample is removed from for testing. Well, with fibromyalgia, I think it's a bit less straightforward because we don't actually have a diagnostic test. Um, so yeah, um, but it's been good learning about the NHS system because obviously it affects me. I think sometimes I'm still surprised sometimes when people have a stigma or discriminate because disability is the only minority group where anyone can be a part of. You know, you can't be white and then suddenly become baby. Um but with disability, it really, really can affect anyone, you mm. know, just one accident and then you can join the group as a minority. So um, I'm surprised at, you know, um, with stigma and discrimination and uh, it, sh it shouldn't happen really. Um, but no, it's been a good few months learning about muscular dystrophy and how it works in the NHS. Hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, my own example, I was yeah working a lot and uh, yeah, enjoying my career. And then um, just, yeah, suddenly my health changed. And uh, yeah, so I, I suppose I'm one of those examples that went from being perfectly healthy to, well, yeah, relatively healthy, but uh, to suddenly being yeah in a completely different position 
that's, yeah but... that's really helped with the yeah you know, the food bank as well because i've seen a lot of people come in through similar situations yeah it's um you know if you have muscular dystrophy um a range of treatment can sort of help so you can get physiotherapy some physical aids um you can have certain medicines but obviously it impacts someone you know cost of living then becomes a bit factor it's the same with fibromyalgia you know if you cannot work full time then you have less income than most people and so it's um um it's heartbreaking really to see um to to see that uh but yeah i think i'm very impressed with the advocacy and information team because they um I think they work with patients every day, so it's um it's very impressive work. And you know, um, I'm just someone behind the computer, um, but it's it's been a great community. I think in some ways, having fibromyalgia, I I mean, I wouldn't, I I wish I didn't have it. I mean, I'm I'm not mm. gonna lie, but having fibromyalgia have really opened my eyes about the health system it gives me a lot of empathy that i don't think i would have before if i was healthy because it gives me a lived experience um but also it's been a lovely community you know i met charlie i met you um i met people in the support group and um it's been a brilliant community because people just enjoy being with each other sharing stories and it's it's not something that I had before. Um, so it's been a good community and yeah, it's it's been great. <laughs> yeah, the, the, too often we're kind of, yeah, we, we think we're alone or you know, nobody really understands, nobody kind of has anything similar. And then finding a, a community like that, we, we suddenly discovered that yeah, people understand and uh, it's one of the things that we see. You know, we we've both been in the in the groups and supporting for a long time, and uh, we're constantly getting new people coming in and saying, "I've never kind of felt, yeah, you know, like anyone's understood me," and uh, and it's so encouraging to see people suddenly feel that relief and. Uh, number of people that we see kind of break down in tears because of yeah having yeah. that support is amazing because it's um it it's a lot isn't it and I was diagnosed in Indonesia privately so to me the diagnosis process was much much quicker um but for most people who are in between diagnosis and knowing what they actually have it's such a stressful time um so it's good to have a community support um i volunteer um for another charity at the same time uh where i taught i befriend an elderly person uh so i give them half hour call every week um and you know they they're very love uh, they're very grateful about support and she always talks about um you know she used to go to the bingo and dancing and um, so I think uh you know a community support is it's great uh when you have that um so yeah it's been um I've been quite honored that I managed to you know go a uh, volunteer in so many lovely charities mm. yeah uh that, that's one of the things I found as well and um, you you mentioned about Northwest London um, looking at changing the way that um, they deal with some of the chronic health and chronic pain kind of things. And uh, I've been, it might have even been part of the same uh, same group, but I was one of the uh, um, the kind of the case studies that they used from yeah having many years to kind of get used to it. Um, along with a few people who are fairly new to um, fibromyalgia and chronic pain, and they were looking at changing the way the diagnosis process works 
because too often we just kind of sent off to one specialist, another one, loads of tests, and then all over the place. And then nobody yeah. really kind of takes ownership of it. They're trying to get the, um, yeah, a kind of almost a specialist GP to take a bit more ownership, spend a bit more time in the initial yeah, appointment, and then be able to kind of take it from there. I think that's definitely true with fibro and ME because there's no diagnostic test to know what you actually have and it's you know obviously checking with any other conditions if you have something else so it's a long list to 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 have a track um but now it's been a great um it's been a great community support um so you know and hands off to you who are still volunteering at food banks i mean it's a physical job as well isn't it and um not so much for me but um yeah that, that's yeah it can be um it for me it's a lot of talking and a bit of computer work but uh that in itself is still very draining as yeah there's a lot of people in there yeah which i didn't expect i mean to be honest the first time i moved to the uk i when I was still living in Indonesia, I thought everyone can ride a horse and play fencing. I think I was watching <laughs> downtown Downton Abbey or something like that. And that's how you imagine people in the UK live. And obviously it wasn't. Yeah, obviously that's how we, we really are. Um, yeah, I've, I've just dressed down today, but normally I'm in that. <laughs> <laughs> My horse riding outfit. <laughs> No, it's it's been a brilliant place and I enjoyed the different culture and I went to this open heritage heritage open days and they have a person from a society called life action role play, I think, where they dress as like yeah. a Normandy warrior or I don't know, something. Um, but it was really interesting. Um and um uh, yeah, so it's it's great. Uh, I really enjoy being here and um, I really hope that we see a better reform of, you know, changes in the future for people with disabilities so we can live better. And, and we're really, really great to have you yeah, in our little fibromyalgia community, but also in the, you yeah, know, on the wider stage, yeah, fighting for public health and uh, all the other work you're doing uh, trying to campaign and make life more manageable for us Ah, oh, thank you but yeah no it's been really lovely talking to you yeah I'm, I'm glad that we finally managed to finally managed to do this and admit and I can spread good word about Indonesia um yeah. I mean it's a it's um the country, I mean, it's still struggling with challenges with, you know, systemic corruptions and violence against minority groups and conflict and, you know, odd laws like defamation and blasphemy laws. Uh, but it's a brilliant place. And if you like biodiversity, um, you know, it's unquestionably one of the most biodiverse country in the world, uh, priority for conservation. Um, so it's good to spread the word uh, about the country that's not just Bali. Yeah, and, and most of the time we'd only get to see some of those animals in the zoo, like you know, Sumatra. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's one of the islands, isn't it? So there's the Sumatran tigers, there's the or orangutans, and yeah, to most of us, those are just animals that are in the zoo. You know, on the last note, I went to Chester Zoo a few years back and they have an Indonesian section okay. in, in in Chester Zoo with it's got its own island and then it's got an it's got an Indonesian shop with items from Indonesia and they have this can uh, it's a it's a tin for crackers. But they sold it as decorative lamps, putting fairy lights inside, and they sold it for like twenty nine, ninety nine pounds, <laughs> and which in Indonesia you could get for like fifty p or a pound. Um, <laughs> and they also, I think they must have gone to um, Indonesia and then take 
magazine covers, images from newspaper to put on the walls as like a decoration. And they have a magazine being framed with the photo of the former dictator, you know, the former president who was leader of the authoritarian regime for 32 years. So I went to the shop manager and I say, do you know who that is? And he's like, no, is that someone important in Indonesia? And then I say to him, you know, he left for 32 years until a mass riot that he had to resign. And he was horrified <laughs> about I, I, it. I, I guess it was one of those things that was put up at some point and people just quickly yeah, lost track of who it was yeah. that was up there and things. But, yeah, um, but... Chester Zoo is... Um, I, I've been to a few of the zoos in the UK and I think Chester Zoo is probably one of the best ones. It's one of the best ones. Uh, I've also been to London Zoo and they were announcing the Sumatran tiger and they say this is Hari and this is Melati and after uh, they gave us the talk, I came up to him and I say, do, do you know what the name means and he said no and I said well Hari means day and Malati means jasmine you know from flower jasmine's flowers and he's like oh that's lovely and then he started doing the announcement afterwards as this is Hari which means day and this is Malati which means jasmine so that's my little contribution uh, well done yeah <laughs> but no lovely to have chatted to you today yeah so um Thank you very much for coming and joining us. Um, that this is Cheetah and this is Chatting with Interesting People. So thank you very much and see you again soon.